message. Thanks for being here. Praise the Lord. Again, welcome everybody to Open Arms Community Church and to part one of our new series called Beauty and the Beast. If you haven't already, you can open up your program to the outline of today's discussion. And as we kick off this series, I've had some who thought this series was about my wife and I. And, uh, and I said, well, they can decide who's beauty and who's beast, right? I'm joking with you. Holy cow. You guys, man, you, you don't let this gray weather get you down. Don't let winter time showing up in springtime bother you because I'm going to tell you, God is so good. And today we're going to have a lot of fun. We're also going to have God speaking to us in a very powerful way. Well, how many are familiar with the story of Beauty and the Beast? Yeah, of course. You know, this is an age-old story. And in this story, we know that there's this handsome prince who lives in a beautiful kingdom who's spoiled rotten, right? Really, um, what happened is, is as he grew up in this kingdom where everything around him was focused on image, focused on appearance, image became an idol in his world. It was the measuring stick that he would compare all things, including himself. And so he, you know, spent a lot of time and a lot of energy and effort in keeping himself beautiful. And he was known as a handsome prince, right? And he only surrounded himself with or associated himself with those who were considered the beautiful people. And so he was very focused and very concerned about his image, his status, and the image or status of those who surrounded him. In the process, friends, of real life transitioning from fairy tale to reality, don't we all know folks that are caught up with image, that are concerned about what other people think about them, that are concerned about uh, making sure that people don't have a low opinion of them, and so they work very hard. They'll spend money they don't have so that they can build up this image, this status with other people. We know, right? Interestingly, as image and status were such a high priority to this prince in his kingdom... There's something that happens, and that is that the, that emphasis on image, the focus, cultivates a serious sin sickness called pride. And it's this elevated view, a high view of image, and if we're achieving that, if we're living up to it, then we have a high view of ourselves and of those who measure up. And what does that mean about those that don't? We have a low view of them. And oftentimes, this low view of those who are different, those who look different than us, dress different than us, talk different than us, smell different than us, this low view will actually... First of all, continue to feed our own ego, our own inflated view of our image, but it will also somehow in our minds justify the poor treatment of those that are different, right? And so sometimes, friends, as we look down upon people who are different than us, we treat them with disrespect and sometimes just blatant cruelty. Have you ever been there? I grew up without Jesus, and I'm going to tell you, we were bullies, punks. 
and I won't tell you the stories of what we did to people who were different. And I wasn't a cool kid. And sometimes that's what we do, right? We're trying, we're striving to meet this inflated view of image, this false standard of a value system. And so even though we don't measure up, what we do is we try to trample on other people to get ourselves higher up the ladder, right? Well, this prince had everything going for him because he was handsome. He was one of the pretty people, the cool people. He had it all. And one day, we know the story, right? This handsome prince throws this amazing ball and invites all the pretty people. And as they, the beautiful people, dance to the beautiful music and feed on the beautiful food, with a bolt of lightning, a crash of thunder, one of the doors bursts open, and in comes walking an old, ugly hag carrying a single rose to bring to this prince as a gift. We know the story. We know it was a test. And the prince failed. The prince met her kindness with hostility. He rejected her. He made fun of her and ultimately tried to have her cast out. And before the guards could seize her and throw her out of the palace, she transforms into this beautiful enchantress that took the breath away of the handsome prince. And in that moment, she spoke a curse. And here's the interesting thing. We know what happened. When she spoke this curse, this handsome prince transformed into this hideous, monstrous beast, right? But if we really think about what happened there, this so-called curse was really a taking what was on the inside and letting it be seen on the outside. Because up to this point, the prince was this most handsome individual on the outside, but on the inside, a monstrous beast. And what this enchantress did, all she did, really, is say what's on the inside is going to be on the outside. The beast on the inside is going to have full expression on the external. And so it transformed his appearance to match what was in his heart, right? And we know that he was imprisoned in this state until, that's part three. So in your outlines, I want you to notice that the prince was judged for his idolatry of image and the proud behavior that f flowed out of the idolatry of image. And that's a fairy tale, certainly something we could learn from, but a fairy tale nonetheless. But did you know there was, in fact, a true story of something very similar? In the days of the prophet Isaiah, God's people who knew the truth, they knew right and wrong, they knew the fallacy of this God called image. They knew that it would only produce bad things along with the many other false gods that the world worshipped. And as God's people, they were to worship and serve and love the one true God and him only. And he set the standard of what was right, what was wrong, what was important, what wasn't, what was valuable, what was not. And interestingly, these people who saw God do amazing things in the life of their nation began to drift 
from the one true God, began to drift from his standards and began to value what the rest of the world valued. They began to look at the world the way the world looks at the world. You see, when anchored to God, we have a view on life and the world that's called reality or truth. But as we loosen our grip on God and we drift away from Jesus, what happens? Our understanding and our perspective become less clear. They become blurred. And we begin to look at things in a wrong way. And we begin to value things in a wrong way. And this is what happened to God's people in the days of the prophet Isaiah. And here is what God himself said in Isaiah chapter 3. The Lord says, The women of Zion are haughty, walking along with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes, strutting along with swaying hips, with ornaments jingling on their ankles. Therefore, the Lord will bring sores on the heads of the women of Zion. The Lord will make their scalps bald. In that day, the Lord will snatch away their finery, the bangles and headbands and crescent necklaces, the earrings and bracelets and veils, the headdresses and anklets and sashes, the perfume bottles and charms, the signet rings and nose rings, the fine robes and the capes and cloaks, the purses and mirrors, and the linen garments and tiaras and shawls. Instead of fragrance, there will be a stench. Instead of a sash, a rope. Instead of well-dressed hair, baldness. Instead of fine clothing, sackcloth. Instead of beauty, branding. Your men will fall by the sword, your warriors in battle. The gates of Zion will lament and mourn. Destitute, she will sit on the ground. There's a danger and a warning that God speaks to his people. You see, in this text, we find this warning that it doesn't matter how pretty and beautiful things are on the outside. What's on the inside is going to come out. And as we drift further and further away from God and his ways and we fix our eyes and our values and our focus and our energies and our attention on the things of this world and the standards that it sets of what's successful, what's important, what's valuable, what's beautiful or handsome, guess what? It leads to a very ugly existence no matter how beautiful things are on the outside, and eventually, one, an existence where what is the ugliness on the inside becomes the ugliness in our world. And as we can see, it's a sad place. They will lament and they will mourn. So, in your outlines, the fixation with image and this pride condition that it cultivates is idolatry, and it is deceptive and destructive. We see that. This fairy tale of how the enchantress places a curse on the handsome prince who is selfish and arrogant and rude is really a truth, a biblical principle that we find in Scripture. That God warns us of the dangers of the idolatry of image. The lifting up of appearance or status. He warns us that it's destructive. And whether we achieve that standard or not, that it is a sad place. And if we become its prisoner, it leads to destruction and a miserable existence. God warns us. 
as followers of Jesus, as God's people, we are not. We are not to look at the world and to judge the world. We are not to look at the world and, and try to measure up to its standards of appearance. We are not to consider things from an earthly perspective because that perspective is very limited and usually wrong. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, the prophet Samuel was told by God to go find a new king for Israel because King Saul had walked away from God. And he had disqualified himself to be the king over God's people. And so being rejected by God, the Lord spoke to the prophet Samuel and said, it's time to go pick a new one. And here's where I want you to go. Go to Bethlehem and find the house of Jesse. For I have chosen his son. So he goes. And we know the story, right? So... Prophet Samuel travels a distance. He lands in Bethlehem and finds the house of Jesse and has Jesse call his sons together. And there, out of all his sons, and we know David was missing. He was out working. But of the sons that had assembled, the oldest and strongest, the biggest among them as well, handsome, is standing there. And the prophet Samuel sees him and goes, oh, surely. Surely, that is the Lord's choice. And God speaks to Samuel. Notice what he says in verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. Isn't that interesting? He says, don't look at his appearance. Don't look at the things everybody else looks at because God doesn't look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. As God's people today, friends, let's hear the words of Jesus in John chapter 7, where he says, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. You see, as you and I live in this world, as God's people, you and I are going to be tempted. Tempted to look at life, to think about life, and to engage life in ways that are very, very superficial, in ways that are very, very unfulfilling in the end, in ways that can be oftentimes destructive. You and I will be tempted to look at other people and judge them based upon their appearance. You and I will discern whether they're the kind of person we would want to be friendly with. Whether they're the kind of person we would like to have over for dinner or that we deem worthy of our help, let alone just to be having a conversation with them. Do we want to be seen with this kind of person, right? We've all been there. We know lots of people like that. But how many times have we looked at a person and we thought, on the other side of the spectrum, they had their life together. That's the kind of person I'd like to be friends with. That's a successful person. That's a person that has it all. And then you get to know them, and you realize far from the truth. Oh, they've got a great image. They've fooled a lot of people into thinking everything's great. But in reality, they're a mess. Their life is a mess. They're broken. They're hurting, right? So often, friends, we as Christians can get sucked into the temptation of thinking 
that we've got to put up that facade, that false wall, and only let people see the pretty parts of life. Never let them see you hurting. Never let them see you weak. Never let them see you sweat, right? But as Christians, we are to be the most realistic people. We are to live in truth, so we certainly ought to be able to face it, right? And deal with it. Because in there, we find freedom. Freedom to be who we were supposed to be with no pretense. Freedom to just love people for who they are, not who the world has tried to pressure and conform us into being. Haven't you noticed that the standards of the world constantly change? That what is pretty today will be fatted out in five to 10 years, and it'll be something new, right? Don't get caught up in these cycles, judging yourself or judging others. On the outside, our handsome prince who later became the beast, notice in your outlines that the beast was an outward expression of the inward ugliness. And as we already pointed out, what's on the inside will come out. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 6. He said, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks... What the heart is full of. And there are references in Matthew 12 and Matthew 15 where Jesus said the same thing. And this is what happens. Have you ever seen somebody whose life seemed perfect, picture perfect? It all looked so glamorous. It all looked so together so successful and beautiful. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, you hear the great crash, right? Marriage falls apart. They lose house. They lose whatever. Or they come clean with an addiction of some sort or some other problem. And we never saw it coming. It blindsides us, right? Why? Because they did a great job with the pretense, the false wall, with the image. And as they worked so hard to prop up that image and keep everybody from seeing behind the screen and seeing what was really going on, they created their own prison. And so all their problems were theirs and theirs alone to face and to deal with. And let me tell you something about life. It's bigger than you. You can't do it alone. We need one another to help one another and to walk this journey to become all that God has made us to be and to free us from all those things that the world would try to chain us with. We can't do it alone. But when we build up the idol, the God of image, and we're putting all our energies into propping that up, number one, we're not working on ourselves. And number two, number two, we just built our own prison. And nobody can help us because nobody knows. Right? Jesus teaches us that what is on the inside is going to come out. In our words, our actions, our attitudes, and as we said, we become this imprisoned beast. And if you remember the story of the beauty and the beast, the beast condition had its time limit of redemption. He had so long to to redeem himself. 
And then time was up and he was forever imprisoned, hopelessly imprisoned in the beast condition. And you and I have a time limit, right? Here it is, your last breath. We have one lifetime and we all know that those vary from person to person. We have one lifetime to figure out, one lifetime to enter in to redemption. And the good news is there is redemption. There is a hope. We are not these hopelessly lost beasts that are forever imprisoned in that condition. So let me very quickly tell you about another character in our story. One who was not like the prince or those that surrounded him that were idolaters of image, even though she was also herself surrounded by those deluded by the god of image. And her name was Belle. Belle, by the way, is the French word for beauty, right? An Italian word for beauty. Belle, though, interestingly, she wasn't in the, the prince's kingdom. She lived in this small town, a village, a ways away. But even though she wasn't surrounded by all the prince's beautiful people, there were people in the town who idolized image as well. And one of the biggest idolaters of image is a guy by the name of Gaston. And Gaston was considered the most handsome of men, strongest, biggest, and the most successful. And every man envied him, not only of his achievements and acquisitions, but also all the ladies that flocked. And all the ladies, well, they all hoped to be able to woo and win the heart of Gaston. But his eyes were set on somebody else, somebody who was very, very different, and that was this young woman named Belle. And in your outlines, Belle was not wooed or fooled by the external appearance of beauty or success. She refused to be enamored or deceived by the power of image. And of those who idolized image and would try to make their way into her life, either to influence her to embrace this false standard or to embrace them, like Gaston, who was trying to win over the heart of Belle and make her his wife. She unwaveringly resisted all of his advances and wanted nothing to do with that world. Now, before we go any further, let me just make a side note that the Bible does address the priority of appearance or image in this way, that we are to keep it from being a god in our life, an idol, okay, number one, and I want to make this clear. So when it comes to image, we've already gotten this picture, right? That, that image is not to be an idol in our life. But we are to care for our physical bodies. Sometimes when we talk about how people idolize image, some will be tempted to use it as a license to disregard their health and well-being altogether. And we want to make sure that we care for this temple of God, that we value it rightly. Because remember this, Jesus loves you, and he wants what is best for you, and he wants you to be the best version of who he made you to be. And that is not a sick and unhealthy person because of poor health habits. Are we following that? So let's make sure that we don't use this cutting down of the image of, of the idolatry of image as a license to just disregard 
care of ourselves. Make sure that we rightly value this gift that God has given us because he did not make us to be a poor version of ourself. He made us to be the best version of who we are supposed to be, okay? Inside and out. Because of Belle's grip on reality here, she was not blinded by the handsomeness and the beauty of those who idolized image that surrounded her. So she was not wooed by Gaston's advances, nor was she repulsed and repelled by the hideousness of the beastly condition of the handsome prince that was a monster, right? She could see through the ugliness. She could see through this monstrosity to what the potential was on the inside. And because of her grip on reality, friends, in your outlines, Belle was able to speak truth authoritatively into the life of the beast that ultimately led to his redemption. If you've seen the movie, read the story, you know that Bell confronted the beastly behaviors, right, of the prince. And her confronting these issues, and that's what love does, friends. It doesn't ignore problems. It doesn't pretend that they didn't happen. It doesn't sweep them under the rug or paint them up real pretty. It addresses the issues because that's how we fix things. Okay? And Bell was able to be a grounded person because she did not worship the God of image. And she wasn't moved by it. And I wonder, friends, how God might want to use us today. Who in our life is living behind that false wall? Who in our life is making their own prison by putting up an image, a front? But really, behind that wall are hurting, are broken, are messed up, are in trouble. Who might God be leading us to speak loving truth into their life, to come alongside of them and help them, to see through the beastliness of their life and see the potential within? And what kind of corrective truth might God be speaking to us today? Maybe we are the beast. Maybe God is wanting to speak loving truth into our life about our own condition. Maybe we're ones who are putting up that false wall, right? Worshiping the idol of image, constantly driving ourselves crazy and to the point of exhaustion and poverty, trying to keep up with the rat race of measuring up to the world's standard of beauty and success. Maybe God is speaking to us about how we might be judging others or treating poorly others because they're different. What is God saying to our hearts today? What monster does God want to set us free from? In your outlines, Bell represents this epitome of external beauty that comes from internal beauty. You see, whether Belle was, con- was in fact the most beautiful girl in the land is really arguable, isn't it? Because the standard of what is attractive to a person 
is different from one person to the next. And that's by God's design. We're all unique. Right? So to say that Belle was the most beautiful girl, maybe she was to this person. But she may not have been to another. And that's how attraction works. But was Belle beautiful? Yes. With the right kind of beauty. A beauty that we all, according to God, are meant to walk in. A beauty that comes from the inside and works its way out. In 1 Peter chapter 3, this is what God has to tell us. Your beauty should not come from. That means that the source of your beauty should not be, here it is, outward. That's where we get stuck, is on the outward, keeping up the image. Does my house look good enough? Is it, am I driving the right kind of car? Am I wearing the right kind of clothes? Does my makeup look good? Right? How slim and trim am I? This is where we get stuck. And yet, our beauty, the source of our beauty, should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Notice that it doesn't say you can't wear that stuff. It's not wrong to braid our hair or wear jewelry, it says that that should not be the source of our beauty. You see, ladies, you make those earrings look good, right? You make the sweater or that dress look good. It's not the other way around. It's a different perspective, isn't it? one that we're not used to, one that we have a hard time buying into even. And yet, here it is. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, circle the word inner, the unfading beauty, circle the word unfading, of a gentle and quiet spirit, circle the word spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Notice, our beauty is not to come from the outward, but what? The inner self, the spirit. Do you see it? And I want you to make note of this. I had you circle the word unfading, right? That word unfading in the Greek means eternal, what lasts forever. God wants you to walk in an eternal beauty A beauty that lasts forever, and it doesn't come from braided hair, jewelry, or fine clothing. It doesn't come from a bank account that's full or a certain car. It comes from the inside, friends. And do you know what it produces? Check this out. Do you see where it says a quiet and gentle, a gentle and quiet spirit? You can underline the word quiet there because the word quiet, here's what it means. It doesn't mean stay silent. That's what you and I think of, right? So God wants us to be gentle, soft with one another, and quiet. Don't say a word. That's not what this is saying. God does want us to be gentle with one another, a kindness, right? A gentle and quiet spirit, not a quiet mouth. A quiet spirit is, here's what the word quiet means, sound and stable and strong. Quiet. It's unmoved in the challenges of life. Unfearing. Confident. There's something beautiful about that kind of strength, isn't there? That kind of soundness and stability that though all hell is breaking loose around you, you have peace. It's a beautiful thing. And it's a beauty that you and I are to walk in. 
in your outlines, eternal beauty, beauty of the highest value, a beauty that never fades away or spoils, comes from what is on the inside. Where does beauty come from? The inner self, the spirit. We also call it the heart, right? Now here's where we find ourselves as we prepare to go. Some of us, our heart is exactly what Jesus said. It's, it's a beast. It's ugly. It's evil, right? And so we've got this problem. Here's the problem. If this eternal beauty comes out of the heart, but my heart is not beautiful, how do I change that? Because according to Jesus, what's on the outside is the fruit of what's on the inside. How many understand that what makes an apple tree an apple tree isn't the apples on the branches, but what's on the inside of the tree? So with that in mind, if I don't like the ugliness on the outside of my tree, I will be tempted to just think, I'm going to go pick all the apples. But here's the problem. If I want oranges, you can pick all those apples, every single one of them, and guess what's going to happen? They're going to grow back. Because while we, even if we glued oranges to the tree, would it make it an orange tree? No. No. And here is our problem with humanity is that we recognize we, we don't like the fruit, and we want to get that fruit out of here. But we think if we just do our best to work hard and get rid of that fruit and, and work hard to add. And, of course, we can't grow it ourselves. So we try to glue it on good fruit that that will make everything better. It doesn't. And this is why we find ourselves so disappointed with self-help. Because all self can do if we really want to stop growing those apples is cut the tree down. But then there's no life, just dead, right? So self-help leads us to one place if we want to get rid of that kind of fruit. And now you understand why some people come to that place of hopelessness and despair where there's only one answer, cut the tree down. Aren't you glad Jesus provided another option? the creator, the one who made you, the one who loves you, the one who is for you and not against you, can do what you and I cannot do. He can go and reach inside the heart of the tree and change the nature of the tree so that it's no longer a producer of wickedness and evil and wrong. But instead, it starts to produce life, truth, and eternal beauty. Isn't that awesome? How do we do that? We come to Jesus. That's what Jesus did. See, he entered our world, and as a human being, he was the same kind of tree as you and I, but he produced the right kind of fruit, and then he laid his life down and allowed his blood to be spilt so we could have a DNA transfer. And the Bible says that the Spirit of God will enter our being and will change us. Now it's going to take time. You have apples on your branches. And God will deal with those. It takes time. And it also takes time to start growing this new fruit, right? But time's on our side when we walk with Jesus. Whatever amount of days we have on this earth, time. And we have a promise of life beyond this earth, more time. Isn't that cool? 
So I wonder if God might be tugging on your heart today. Have we been working so hard to rip off the apples and glue on the oranges in hopes that that would make things better? Have we been tempted to just cut the tree down because we're sick and tired of being sick and tired and we have no other hope? Is the Lord touching our heart today, saying, let me do in you what you can't do for yourself? Let's close our eyes and pray. If God's tugging on your heart to, for the very first time, come to him and ask him to make you this new person on the inside so that it'll start to grow and work its way onto the outside, by making Jesus, not image, not wealth, not pleasure, but by making Jesus the Lord of your life. If that's you, I want to invite you to pray a simple prayer with the rest of our church family. And for some of us in this room, we've made this prayer, and God has worked a work in our hearts, but like we read in Isaiah, we have kind of drifted. We've kind of got sucked back into getting caught up in the world's way of looking at things and doing things. And today we sense God saying it's time to refresh our perspective, renew our commitment to doing life God's way, seeing ourselves and seeing others God's way. And if that's you, I want to invite you to pray this same prayer of commitment. So all together, pray this prayer with me and say, Father God, thank you for loving me, for wanting me, and pursuing me. This day, I confess that I've been ugly on the inside. I've been selfish and wrong. And I've hurt myself, and I've hurt others. Please forgive me. In the name of Jesus, I declare Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life, and I renounce the God of image, the God of wealth, the God of pleasure, and any other thing that may try to steal my heart away from the one true God and who he made me to be. From this day forward, I commit myself to love God, love people, do life his way, and get his results. In Jesus' name, amen.